We welcome you to World Class Sunday School. As always, it's a pleasure to have you join us as we continue to read and study God's Word. Let's go in prayer. Lord, today again, we're thankful for this time to share in your words. We pray that our hearts and minds are open to what you are teaching us, that we have a desire to learn more about you so we can serve you better. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks and praises always. Uh, we're continuing in our one a quarter, and we're talking about faith that pleases God. And today's lesson from Unit 2, here in Unit 2, we're talking about learning about faith. And today the title of our lesson is Faith and Transformation. And it's coming from Romans, the 12th chapter, and our printed text is found in verses 3 through 8. Now here, uh, Paul is the writer of our lesson today, and uh, he, he's writing to the Christians in Rome while in Corinth, in, in route to Jerusalem with money that was given to the poor saints there. And he was writing to introduce himself in advance of his anticipated visit. Paul had never visited the church at Rome, but he he anticipated uh, visiting them. And the theme, the theme of this letter to the church at Rome is God is righteous, man is not. Only by faith in Jesus Christ can we be right with God. Now I want to say that again. Paul is teaching us that only by faith in Jesus Christ can we be right with God? This letter uh, to the Roman Christians can be divided into two parts, or two major sections. Uh, the first section, chapters uh, 1 through 11 in Rome, uh, is mostly doctrinal, while the second section, chapters 12 through 16, teaches Christians how, how to live a light of the truth that these doctrines teach. In, the, in our lesson today, we have two outlines that's, that's going to uh, guide us. The first outline is found in Romans 12, verses 3 through 5, and that's how to think. Paul is going to teach us how to think. And then uh, the second outline is found in verses 6 through 8. And in those verses, Paul is going to teach us how to serve. So today we're going to learn, we're going to learn how to think, and then we're going to learn how to save. Starting in uh, verse 3 of chapter 12, in our first outline, how to think, and we're going to look at verse, verse 3. And so verse 3 says, and this is talking about self. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So, so first, the first, first thing we need to do is, Paul is showing us that we need to get down off our high horses. And, not, and we need to think, uh, it says, think, uh, not to think more highly of ourselves than we are. Now, he didn't say not to think high of ourselves. He said more highly. So that, that, that's uh, thinking more of ourselves than, than what we really are, or who we really are. Okay, then, then it goes on to say, but to think soberly. According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So the, uh, in, in verse 2, if you go back to verse 2 in, in this chapter, it talks about uh, not conforming to the world, but being transformed. And, and that's what he's teaching us, how, how our faith is going to help us to be transformed. And the renewing of the man in verse, verse uh, 2 of this chapter is the transformation that takes place as the Holy Spirit changed our thinking 
And so we're not to think as the world anymore. That, that's what we did in the, in the old life. But we've been, uh, when we've been, Christ has accepted us. God has accepted us into his family. And now, now we're in a process of having our minds changed, our thinking changed. We're no longer thinking carnal or thinking worldly. In order for the transformation to take place, there's some things that we must do. We must constantly study and meditate on God's word, the scripture. We need it before us. We need to read it, we need to meditate on it, we need to digest it, and we need to make it a part of our life. And all that, that process, is a transformation. It's transforming our mind. And it's going to have us thinking godly instead of thinking worldly. Okay, it says, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. And now in verse 1, it talks about God has given us grace. It says, through the grace given unto us, Paul has been called by God, and Paul has been given the authority by God to tell believers how to think of themselves in an appropriate manner. So, so we, can't, we can't get angry at Paul because God has called him and given him this authority to teach us and tell us how to think. Okay, and he says, think soberly. And what he's talking about is exercising sound judgment. When we think soberly, we exercise sound judgment. When we think soberly, we will, uh, evaluate ourselves not by worldly standards, but through the eyes of Almighty God. That's what he means when he tells us to not to think worldly, but to think soberly. So when, when we do that, we are exercising sound judgment. And we see ourselves as not the world sees us, but how God sees us. And then verse 4, now, that, now verse 3 was about self. Verse 4 is about others. Okay, and verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have the same office. Paul uses the analogy of the human body to illustrate how Christians should live and work together. Hey, look, don't say, don't say we, can't, we can't live and work together. Here's the formula right here. Paul is giving it to us. And he's going to show us how we as Christians are not to be fighting and bickering with one another, but how to live and how to work together. He says, there are many members, and he's talking about the church. The church have many members, and all members have not the same office. And what he's saying is all members have not, not the same deeds or responsibilities. That's what, it, that's what he's saying. So, so here in verse 4, we see that, that as a church, we are many, but we have different deeds and responsibilities that we should do. Verse 5 says, So we being many, referring to the church, as one body in Christ. We are, we are the church, Christ is the head. And, and every one member, one of another. So we being the church, under Christ, Christ being the head, as Christians, we cannot serve effectively apart from other Christians. I'm going to say that again. We the church, Christ is the head. We as Christians cannot serve effectively apart from other Christians. That's what, that's what he's, he's showing us here. So we being many as one body in Christ, and every one member, one of another. The, and we can't be effective. We cannot serve effectively. Everybody trying to go their separate way. Okay, we, we are to be a unit together. 
Now, okay, now he, he's given us this analogy of how the church operates like, like the human body. And the body cannot operate apart from the head. You know, the, our, our brain controls the body parts. And so Christ controls the church. Christ is the head. And Christians working together under the command and authority of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're operating any other way, then you are out of order. That's what, that's what Paul is showing us. And what, what causes confusion and what causes differences in, in bickering and fighting in the church? Someone is out of order. Because God is all about order. Now, and, and we are under his command and leadership. Then we should all be on one accord. We should all have the same, same purpose. And when we do that, when we do... Uh, when we follow these directions that Paul is giving us, then we're going to be in order and the church is going to work much smoother. It's right here in, in the Word of God. So we being many as one body in Christ and every member one of another. Okay, so in, our, in, our, in the first part, the first portion of our, our lesson, Paul is teaching us how to think. He says, we're going we're gonna to be transformed from worldly thinking to godly thinking. And it, then he shows us how, how this transformation process is going to take place. And the things that we have to do, and that's studying God's word, meditating on, on God's word, and allowing God's word to transform our mind. Now he's going to show us here in the second portion of this lesson, he's going to show us how to serve. Now, we can serve now that, that we are thinking right. We are thinking soberly. We are, we are thinking godly. Now, we are, we are ready to serve. But until, until this time now, we, we're going to have problems serving if our thinking is not right. Okay, so here we're going to look at how to serve in chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. A. In verse 6, it says, Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us. Okay, Paul is going to explain to us the gifts that God has given us in order for us to work together and, and, and make the church go smoothly. And so first he's starting out talking about gifts. Okay, now let, it, there, there are some things we need to keep in mind about gifts as, as we go through this. The first thing is that all gifts and abilities comes from God. All gifts and abilities comes from God. Okay, we also need to keep in mind that God gives gifts to edify the church. That's to build the church up. Not for our personal success. So, so the gifts are given to us by God for the edification of the church. Okay, and not, and not, not to, to build ourselves up, but not for our, our personal success. It's for the church, for the whole body. Okay, another thing is, not everyone has the same gift. And you know, it was so much confusion in the church at Corinth about gifts. Paul had to, had to write a whole chapter concerning those. But here he's giving us some insight on how, how to look at gifts. Uh, and uh, he says that, that uh, all gifts come from God. God gives gifts to edify the church, to build the church up, and not to build up personal individuals. And gifts are given, uh, and then not everyone has the same gift. And then another thing is gifts vary. They vary in nature, they vary in power, and they vary in effectiveness. So gifts vary. Okay, 
Then he says, according to the grace that is given us. And here grace in, in this particular scripture means undeserving and unmerited. Give, uh, uh, the grace that is given us means that it's undeserving and unmerited. That means that, that in and of ourselves, we don't deserve what God is giving us. It's nothing you can do to earn the favor of God as far as gifts go. God gives gifts according to his will. And now, now he goes on to the name here in these uh, following verses. We're going to see Paul list uh, seven gifts. Now, these gifts that Paul is listing here does not exalt the list of gifts. There are many gifts. But Paul is using these gifts as an example. And the first four gifts are, are notable gifts and gifts that stand out. They are prophecy, ministry, teaching, and exaltation. Let's, let's read it. It says, it says prophecy. Prophecy here is, is he's talking about proclaiming uh, God's word. Okay, it says whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the uh, proportion of faith. And then he says our ministry, that's, that's serving. Let us wait on our ministry and on teaching. That's, that's expounding on God's word. He that teaches on teaching. And then he that exalted on exaltation. And this uh, exalted means to encourage or, or to lift up or to build someone up. Okay, so here what we're looking at in, in verses uh, 6 through 8a, eight, eight, we're looking at, it says, well-defined gifts. Those are gifts that are notable and, and gifts that, are, that stands out. And what, what the church that I mentioned earlier was, was uh, confused about, they, were, they wanted, everyone wanted the gifts that, that, that was really popular. And so it brought, brought a lot of confusion into the church. Okay, so, so these gifts, that, that, that the first four gifts he mentioned here are the most notable gifts are the well-defined well gifts. But then the, the other three gifts in this list of seven, these are less defined gifts. All right, these three gifts are giving. It says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Okay, and then he that ruleth with diligence. And here, here he's talking about uh, church leadership. And then 8b said, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And this here he's talking about compassion. You know, uh, mercy is not just saying, uh, seeing people in need or a person in need and, you know, just uh, lip service. But this is actually going in and doing something to, to help that person. So these three, these last three gifts, the first four gifts are well-defined gifts. Those are gifts that stand out. And then the last three here are less-defined gifts. Okay, so, so here what, first of all, because gifts are categorized as well-defined gifts and less-defined gifts does not mean that one gift is more or less important than other gifts. They are all, all gifts that God gives to the church are important. And uh, like, like all body parts are important. Remember now he, he's using the analogy of a body, of a human body. And all body parts are important and used so the body functions properly. That's the same purpose of the gifts. Paul is showing that spiritual gifts serves as an example of a church that is united in diversity. Now, on the other hand, in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Paul lets us know that all gifts are important, 
But all gifts are not equal, and all believers are not equally gifted. A, a quick example, uh, your hands and your heart. They are both important to the body's function, but they are not equal because the, you can, the, the hands are important and the heart is important. But without a hand, you, the body can still somewhat function, but not without the heart. So they're not equal, but they are both important. Okay, now we sometimes pay more attention to the gifts that are more visible those and uh, are well defined. And, the, and the, the danger here to those having these gifts could be pride. And please don't get lifted up in pride because God has given you a gift that, that stands out. Because now remember now all gifts come, come from God and they are given to edify the church, not, to, not the individual. But on the other hand, the danger to those having less defined gifts uh, or the less visible gifts is not using them. Don't, don't hold back on your gift if you, just, if you yourself feel it's, it's not important. God, is, God has given uh, gifts and it's important that we use that gift in order to build up the church. Okay, and so so uh, so we we we're not gonna uh, get over proudful because God has given us a a highly visible gift, and we're not gonna feel left out because He gives us a less visible gift. We're gonna use it, whatever gift God gives us. We're gonna use it with uh, all the option we have in order that the gift may do what God intends for us to do. Luke, the 17th chapter, verses 10, tells us that when we have done all that is commanded, we have done that which is our duty, our reasonable service, our spiritual service. We are presenting ourselves to God. And so what we do, we don't, don't stop and give, give yourself a pat on the back. We, are, we can only do it as God leads us and gives us the ability to. Now, to those who don't know their gifts. Now, there, there are some people who say, well, you know, I, I really don't have a gift. We, uh, every believer ha has a gift. When I was uh, teaching a new members class at our church, at the end of, of the, those sessions, those teaching sessions to the new members, we would do uh, an assessment and evaluation of gifts. It was a gift analysis. And you could take that uh, test, uh, whatever you want to call it, evaluation, and it would, it would point you to your most uh, likely gift and your second most likely gift and your third most likely gift. Now, it wasn't foolproof, but it would give you a, a good indication of what gift that God had given you. Now, uh, you know, and, and maybe you can go that, go that route, but I would encourage you, if you feel that you don't know what your gift is, go, in, go to God in prayer and ask him. God, uh, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church, so God knows what gift he's given you and if you go in prayer and, and seek, uh, seek his face and ask him what gift you have, I'm sure he, he will reveal it to you. But don't ever say you don't have a gift because every believer ha has a gift. And in that uh, uh, Corinthians 12 chapter, when Paul was uh, trying to get the church at Corinth straight on, on gifts, and, and he, he was saying, then he went on in chapter 13 to talk about the gift that every believer has, and that's the gift of love. And so if you, if you don't operate in any other gift, then operate in the gift of love that God has given to every believer. Lord, we thank you for this time. 
thank you for your your word. You just make it so so plain to us at how we should think and then how we should serve. Thank you for the insight. We give you praise, glory, and honor because you are so deserving. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks and praises always. Well, friends, again, uh, we thank you for joining us on today, and we look forward to having you in our next session. So until then, may God richly bless and keep you is our prayer. And to our Internet guests, if you haven't already, we're going to continue to remind you to please go down and subscribe to this cast so that when we come up, you'll be notified. That way you won't miss us. And also share with your family, your friends, your Sunday school classes that we are here so they too can join in and be blessed by the Word of God here at World Class Sunday School.